road. But three losses later, the Lions are back into their dead, standing at two and four, and in danger of falling three back of the Vikings and the Bears if they lose at home today against four and two Chicago. One reason the Lions have not roared, their last interception came September 11th. Wouldn't it be good timing to pick off a few against their ex-quarterback, Eric Kramer? Kramer's shoulder is healed, so despite three straight Chicago wins under Steve Walsh, Kramer gets the nod. Tough call for Coach Dave wants that, or not really. Let's get the scoop from our Mark Malone in the Silverdome. Mark? Thanks, Chris. Before we get to the Chicago quarterback situation, some breaking news. Bears running back Tim Worley missed the team charter yesterday afternoon. The Bears tell me that they've contacted the local authorities, as well as Worley's wife, who says she doesn't know where Tim is either. So apparently, Tim Worley is missing. On the other hand, Chicago quarterback Eric Kramer wouldn't miss this opportunity for the world. He spent most of his career here in Detroit trying to earn some respect. A win today, to a certain degree, would vindicate Kramer, but it won't be made any easier by his former teammates and one close friend, Detroit linebacker Chris Spielman. He's just another empty face in the opposing team's jersey, and uh, our job is to, uh, to eliminate that opposition. And uh, whether it be Eric or whether it be... Uh, your best friend in the world, or your brother, or sister, father, whatever. At that point in time, nothing matters but winning, and that's the way you got to approach it. Kramer's return to the lineup has been the focus of some criticism in Chicago. Before suffering a shoulder injury, Kramer was one and two as a starter. Backup Steve Walsh has led the team to three straight victories. However, how much credit Walsh should get for those wins is still up for debate. Perception or reality? The perception is that Steve Walsh was the catalyst that helped awaken the slumbering Bears. The reality? Walsh threw only two touchdowns and is averaging less than 200 yards passing in the three wins. What is the real difference? One theory is mental. The biggest factor really has been just uh, the attitude of the players, I think. Well, after the loss to Minnesota, and that was the second week of really getting blown out, um, you know, Dave challenged us. Uh, got in our face, so to speak. Whenever you have a group of guys that are as young as we are uh, collectively, uh, I think you need a coach that's going to be vocal. Either you were going to come along for the ride with that same level or fall by the wayside. And I think everybody got the message that we need to pick up that part of our game. While Wanstead's Mike Ditka-like meeting room tirade left its mark, some feel the turnaround was physical. Well, I think the biggest thing, we, we've been able to run the ball much better the last three weeks. And, and that has really helped. That's taken a lot of pressure off the quarterback. And, um, and we haven't turned the ball over. Only two turnovers, to be exact. A small portion of the Bears' league-low five giveaways. And 115 yards rushing per game. More than twice the total for weeks one, two, and three. I don't feel like it's, it's our job necessarily to go out and, just, and, and rack it up every week. We're gonna, we have to have to play consistent. We've sold to our quarterbacks from the very beginning, that they're one of 11 guys on the offensive side of the ball. It's kind of hard to, to compare, you know, what Eric did and what I've done. Uh, you know, we've had a little bit more opportunities because the defense has played better and got us the ball a little bit more often. Specifically, eight takeaways in Walsh's three games and only two in Kramer's three starts. Perception or reality? Statistically, Kramer played much better than his one and two record. He still leads the NFC in quarterback efficiency. If Steve Walsh plays or Eric Kramer, is it going to be that much of a difference as to whether or not you win or lose? I really don't think so. Uh, nobody's happier for Steve than, than I am. Our players got confidence in Steve. Uh, but in the same token, I haven't uh, fudged one bit on, on what I believe and what I know Eric Kramer can do. I'm not going to go out and say, i got to win this game to save my job, or I'm, I've got to win this game for us. i got to go out and play like I've been playing. The team's playing better now. So that's going to help. To further complicate matters for Kramer and the Bears, Chicago will be thin at running back. Rookie fullback Raymond Harris will make his first start since Merrill Hodge has retired. And remember, Chris, if something were to happen to Spencer Tillman, Tim Worley will not be available. All right, Mark, good job as always. We'll check back with you at the Silverdome in a moment. Quickly, Phil, Kramer over Walsh. Good move or bad move by Wanstead? Well, uh, I think it's a bad move, Chris, and I think one of the reasons they're making this move is this coaching staff and organization made a commitment to Eric Kramer during the offseason for three years and $8 million. Steve Walsh, of course, we all know, has led this team to three straight victories, but the one thing I've noticed since he's been in there, the team has found rhythm, and especially that offense, and that is something hard to do in the NFL is get rhythm. Today, by starting Eric Kramer, 
Joe, they take a chance of upsetting that rhythm. I don't agree with you, Phil. I really, really uh, don't agree with you. I got to be honest with you. I'm, listen, I think Dave Wanstead has cut off a controversy long before it ever could get started. He's made a position. Eric Kramer is his quarterback. It's not a monetary decision. Eric Kramer, Steve Walsh, they're basically interchangeable. Physically about the same skills, mentally about the same skills. I respect what Dave Wanstead has done. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I am a firm believer that quarterbacks do not lose their job, Phil, <laughs> if they get hurt. I still believe that Steve Walsh is a great backup, did a good job, but Kramer is the guy. Joe, so, uh, Watts that's just trying to do something that Wayne Fonz couldn't do in Detroit. That stabilized the offense. You look at Detroit, four different offensive coordinators, run and shoot, semi-run and shoot, four quarterbacks, two weeks ago shotgun offense, today a two-back offense, one coach clearly in control, that's Dave Watts that and one coach, Tom, I think has been in a little bit out of control. That's Wayne Fonz. Yeah, more. we're talking so much about the quarterback for the Bears. I think more important is the quarterback of the Detroit Lions. These are easy numbers to understand. Coach Weinstead has coached 22 games as a head coach, won 11, lost 11. In his 11 losses, they have 8 takeaways. In the 11 wins, he has 32 takeaways. They have to create 8 turnovers today, and they have to do it via pressure on Scott Mitchell because Barry Sanders will not put the ball on the ground. You know, no one's mentioned here in the decision. I mean, Eric Kramer certainly knows Detroit, and maybe Weinstead is backing on some of that knowledge as well in making his decision. Well, you got to love this one. Buccaneers at 49ers. Next week, San Francisco has a bye. Last week, Tampa Bay had a bye. Well, the similarities end there because, let's face it, one team is coming, one is going. Since 1983, the Niners have had 11 straight seasons of 10 wins or more. They're 89 above 500. The Clockwork Orange have had 11 straight seasons of 10 or more losses. They're 87 below 500. Oh, and oh, yes, this one. The Bucs have lost 21 straight games to teams from California. Proof again that you can check out anytime you like, but you can never, ever leave. Game time decision for Deion Sanders, who practiced a bit yesterday for the Niners. The guess is he'll start despite his pulled groin suffered during his 93-yard interception return last week. If not, Toys in the Attic Cook starts at corner. Of course, he and former mate, Deion, that is, Andre Risen, are $7,500 poor as a result of fines doled out by the league stemming from their welterweight bout held in the middle of the Georgia Dome. Don King has promised a rematch on December the 4th. Saints beat the Rams seven straight games until Jerome Bettis ran for 212 yards last year in New Orleans. Today, the Rams returned with Bettis, but without Jim Everett. Well, he's not far away, though. He's quarterbacking the Saints. Rams defensive back Todd Light, quite vocal about the Everett's struggles with the L.A. last season, should have an interesting reunion. By the way, Sean Gilbert out again for the Rams. Coming up, Buddy and the Cards are still talking the talk, despite their 30 point, 35 point drubbing by the Cowboys. And what happened to Scott Mitchell and the Lions since they beat the Cowboys? We'll go back and check in with Mark in Detroit later. The trauma of post-concussion syndrome. Former Jed Altoon remembers. Suicide crossed my mind. Um, and I've, I've never really uh, said it publicly, but, you know, I've talked to my wife. I'm like, you know, you know, there are times where I felt like, you know, it's just, you know, I just want to get away from it. Top of the hour. Bill Belichick's defense. They've allowed the fewest points in the league. Phil and Tom will tell you why. Later, the brain. It's all too fragile. The riveting story of concussions, all too common in the NFL. Also, hail to the Chief, a new leader in Washington. Washington, they're all hailing the Redskins' new quarterback. And next, Dave Brown's reversal of fortune, 3-0 to 0-3. What's he learned? Good. Fame comes quickly. It's kind of like out with the old and in with the new. Oh, yeah, I do know. But so does criticism. Six games into his first season as the Giants starter, it doesn't matter that Dave Brown no longer reads the papers. He gets the message. Dave Brown is no different than anybody else on our team. He's going to be judged over a period of time. If he's playing poorly over a period of time, he's subject to be, uh, you know, a change to be made there, just like any other position. Do you think that was an innocuous comment, or was Dan trying to send you a message? Um, I think it was trying to send a message to me. Obviously, uh, you know, things haven't gone well these past three weeks for us, whether it be my fault or, or anyone else's fault. I've been kind of the one taking the blame for it, and, and I understand that the quarterback is supposed to do that. An ultimatum like that is it's a, it's a wake-up call. And if you don't wake up, then they're going to bring somebody else in there. Giants players and coaches are quick to point out that while Brown probably got way too much credit for the team's initial three wins, he is now probably shouldering way too much blame for their subsequent three losses. 
But the fact is that there have been times in games this year where he's made mistakes on things that in practice he's known absolutely cold. Happened in the Monday night game where I, where I, you know, all week I, I knew to look towards a strong safety and thought we had a play designed to go at him and, and um, I got in a game and for some reason I looked away from the strong safety and I went, I went away from him and, and it ended up being a tip pass and intercepted. That cannot happen because what, when you do that, then you're, you're not only playing against the defense, you're really playing against yourself. He's a young quarterback, he's going to make mistakes. Uh, people didn't realize that once we were 3-0. and But now, the Giants are 3-3, three and three, and Brown is piloting the lowest rated offense in the entire league. In three losses, he has thrown seven interceptions. He has been tricked a couple times uh, by the, the different uh, coverages that he has seen. He's made some mistakes and made some throws that maybe he shouldn't have. The quarterback for the Giants can't make the critical mistake. And that's what I think that I've done the past couple weeks. He's trying to play so perfect. You know, I, I think he's trying to um, play w without making any mistakes. He's trying to overcompensate. He's, he's trying too hard. That you could understand of any young quarterback, especially one who grew up nearby, a Giants fan. But as a youth, he could manage only a single visit to perpetually sold out Giants Stadium. Now, every Sunday, they announce his name. As far as being a novelty of being cool, I think that's kind of wearing off. You know, I, I realize that this is kind of a job, and uh, the first three weeks it was really cool. You know, we're 3 0, but now it's starting to wear off a little bit, and, uh, and I'm starting to understand how tough it is to play. Tough it is to play, certainly in New York. Good job, Jimmy. Phil, you're a whiz, as we all know. Yeah. Does Dave Brown look different uh, now that he's lost three in a row than when he won three in a row? Mechanics different? What's going on? No, I, I think the big problem, Chris, he doesn't look any different, is the decisions he's making on the field. The coaches are designing plays that are there to be thrown for long touchdowns or for big passing, passing plays to help this offense, and Dave is not taking advantage of those. And I'll show you, for instance, two weeks ago against Minnesota, something happened. Here you see a formation, and the play that is called is ace right trip, quick 71, half back out, wing six. Woo! Oh, time out. Woo! I knew you'd yeah, like that, yeah. Joe. See, I can remember these things, Joe. You yeah, can't. Yeah. But, but, but here's the play, and Dave, that what he's supposed to do, the two inside receivers you see, the closest one to him at the top of the screen is Thomas Lewis is going to hook up in the end zone. The slot receiver, uh, Douglas, is going to go down the end zone and run out, and Chris Calloway, if they're covered, is going in the back of the end zone. That's his third uh, option. As the play goes, you can see the first two options are covered. Right there, it should be thrown to the back of the end zone. Instead, he throws, you see Chris Calloway's reaction. Dave doesn't look at him, throws the ball away. That's why there's a little quarterback controversy down in New York. Does, does he get a hook today, or, or, or if he plays poorly, or does he play the whole game? I think the big thing is if he makes these kind of mistakes this week where there's people open for touchdowns, he doesn't hit them, he could get the hook. And the thing that worries me, too, if it does rain down there today, Joe, Dave does have a little problem throwing wet footballs, and that, that could be trouble for him there, too. Well, you've told me he's got a little problem throwing wet footballs. He's got a little problem throwing in the wind. I think Dave Brown's got himself a little problem. But Dan Reeves has got a much bigger problem. He's got an inexperienced quarterback starting. He's got an inexperienced quarterback as a backup. Now, you heard him say before, if he had Joe Montana, he might consider a change. Well, I've got to be honest with you, Dan. I've got a guy sitting next to me that could have been there. But you guys decided to get rid of him. So unfortunately, for the Giants, you have to struggle with inexperience. And that doesn't mean a lot of wins, Tommy. Well, you know, I got pretty familiar with Dan Reeves over the six years I was in Denver. It's pure and simple. Dan Reeves is not going to lose football games without making changes. And if Dave Brown does not play well, and I would say by halftime, then all of a sudden Kent Graham is going to be listening on a little headset. When you heard Dan make the statements earlier in the week about possible changes at quarterback, he wasn't trying to invoke any kind of fear and intimidation to his players. He was just stating the fact that if you don't play well, another guy gets a chance. What a novel idea. You remember Dan Reeves because, as somebody once said, you were there. there. <laughs> Two weeks ago, after Dallas crushed the Cardinals 38-3, to even Buddy Ryan admitted it was a lesson in humility. Today, it sold out Tempe. The Cards try to snap an eight-game losing streak to the champs using ex-Cowboy Steve Berline at the helm. Of course, Lorenzo Lynch, more starting in, uh, uh, starring in Longest Yard 3, said, I still think the Cowboys are afraid of us. Intimidate the Cowboys? Don't think so. I don't think they're going to intimidate them, but I think the Cardinals are going to give the Cowboys a much better game, maybe even beat them today. i tell you why. The Cowboys banged up on the offensive line. Even though Mark Stepanowski starts at center and Mark Tuane starts at left tackle, they are banged up, and i tell you, Eric Swan over the center could have a big game today. Chris. What Arizona needs, though, they need their corners to grow eight inches over the last two weeks to defense Irvin and, and Harper. They're just too tall for those corners. You watch.
Well, they could. They, they get too late to shop anymore. <laughs> Once upon a time, the Redskins and the Colts were neighbors. Games between the two of them caused the biggest traffic jams in Maryland. Today, they meet at Indy, where the Colts with Jim Harbaugh have a chance to get to 500 in late October, a rarity for them. He's Schuler out with a gimpy ankle, but instead of uh, tabbing John Freeze from Idaho, good Tom, Norv Turner is starting <laughs> Gus Farratt from the Tom Owen, Tom Flick, Bob Holly caverns of the Redskins depth chart. Joe, who is this masked man? <laughs> you know, Chris, everybody is going to find out who Gus Farratt is today. When the Redskins decided to make a quarterback change and go with Gus Farratt, you figured, well, I'll find that on the sports pages somewhere in Washington, D.C. But in the city of Washington, D.C., you find out that the quarterback position has a lot more to do with politics than we might think. Prime Time continues. Now from Washington, Sam Donaldson. Tonight on Prime Time Live, an interview with Rosario Ames, a story about what's going on in Haiti, a look at why school buses are dangerous, and finally, and most importantly, a report on Gus Farratt. Who is he? Hey. <laughs> so you guys never thought I'd be here, huh? <laughs> Did you? Did you think you were going to be here? Okay. Oh, the politics of pigskin. There's politics everywhere. Gus Farratt, the seventh round pick from Tulsa, arguably outplayed Heath Schuler and John Freeze in preseason. But come week one, he's third on the depth chart. Why? Here's 19 million possible reasons. And here's 900,000 more. Would it be fair to say that politics and economics enter into decisions at times? It might be fair to say that. No, I, I don't think so. It's the wor real world, and that happens every day. So, I mean, it, I think everybody knew that what happened. It was a victory for the people of Washington. In this election year, voters are tired of the old, unsure about the new. They demand real change. I like Gus. I like Gus. And his name is Gus. And that's another thing. I think that's a big part of this. Gus. Who was the last Gus? last Gus I knew was Gus Lesnovich, was a middleweight boxer. You know any Gus? Many people in this area especially consider, uh, consider this question to be of national importance. What is the administration's feelings on Gus Farratt? Give me a hint. We here at the Commerce Department are absolutely devoted, uh, committed to uh, economic growth and, and job creation, but the one job we're focusing on this weekend is the starting quarterback's job for the Washington Redskins. Do you think there's a, a direct uh, tie-in here to uh, foreign uh, foreign policy issues? None. President Clinton! President Clinton, what do you think about Gus Farad? What about Gus Farad? President Clinton, what do you think about Gus Farad on Sunday? How did North tell you you were going to be the starting quarterback? He told me along with the rest of the team. Uh, we in a team meeting, sitting in the front row, and he said, well, we're going to start another rookie this week, and it's going to be Gus. And how did you feel at that moment? I don't know. I probably needed a new pair of shorts. <laughs> Montana, Marino, Elway, Kelly, Farrakh. How's it sound? Mm, sounds great. It gives you goosebumps. I try to portray the look that, you know, okay, I'm excited, but yet I can do this. I have confidence in myself. You put on a good exterior. Right. You don't want them to see that you're scared. Right. But you and I both know, because I've been in those shoes, you're scared to death. Yeah. Issue one, Gus Farrakh, how successful Put my way. I call my own play. No, I, this football team you don't. Yeah, well, then trade me then. I will trade you. I'll set your rear end right on the bench. You got it? You wouldn't really do that, though. Oh, I'd do it in a minute. Would you? In a minute, okay. I'd do That's it. That's a nice dramatization, whatever you call it. But let me ask you, would you indeed talk to Troy Aikman like that? Would you have the confrontation we saw Hostetler and Shell get into? Terry, you, you know, we, I had confrontations with other players, with assistant coaches, but one thing we did at Miami and at Dallas is we avoided confrontations with the, the quarterback because we didn't want his mind reeling, thinking about that, you know, rather than being calm and collected and ex executing the game plan. And so at all costs, we would pull back on that. And, and I don't think it would ever happen anyway for one thing. You know, the play caller was up in the press box. And what I always had our quarterbacks do is come over on the sideline, get on the telephone, talk to North Turner, talk about the plays, work it out. And so, really, we avoided any confrontation. You know, see, I called more on plays, but when I did have a confrontation and felt strongly about it, the players behind Chuck would actually 
get a lift out of me fighting and arguing with him because it showed that I was confident, that I was in control of what was going on, and I was saying things to him that they knew they couldn't say. But I often wondered that what effect does these sidelines, these outbreaks, what does it have on the other team? What happened to the other players? It, it has a negative effect on those other players because, hey, some of them may not be as, as smart as the quarterback or the head coach. Actually, we played two seasons. We went three and zero. Going out there and doing their duty and, that's, and going out there enough. and executing that's enough. the offense and defense. I'm out of here. You are out of here. Get out of here. Out of Take here. it away, JB. Boy, I would love to have seen you two work together on the football field. All right, folks, when we come back, we'll share our weekly preview of some of today's other games back in a bit. And there are a number of players who would like to see this man get upset and get tossed out of the game. That's because he's the hardest running back to bring down, Barry Sanders. Scott Mitchell making only his 14th NFL start, struggling, completing less than 50% of his passes. Eric Kramer looking to regain his touch after missing three games. And for more on that, let's take you back to the Silverdome and Matt Millen. Thanks, guys. Now, in Chicago, they make the switch this week. They go with Eric Kramer with that bruised shoulder starting in place of Walsh. Remember, Walsh had won three straight, so why make the change? Well, I think two reasons. First of all, I think they call a more aggressive game with Kramer in there, and I think also that Kramer will throw a better deep ball, and that will help this offense. Remember, they're just pound, 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 and wait for your shot. With Kramer, they'll get that shot. In Detroit, they have one thing going wrong right now, and it's been an inconsistent offense. Remember last year, they said, we need a quarterback, we can't settle on anything. I think the battle cry this year in Detroit is, we can't settle on an offensive philosophy. And in fact, when I speak with Mitchell, although he doesn't come right out and say that, he says we can't really settle on one thing. I think that's a problem. Yeah, the other thing that's going wrong in Detroit has been special teams, particularly their kicking game. Jason Hansen's been struggling, so to try to help him along, their solution has been put Greg Montgomery, the punter, as their holder. And when I thought about it, I had a better solution. I think if you take a look at this picture, you'll see that this is a solution that works every time. But JB, if you take a really close look at this picture, I think you'll see that the Stooges involved are really top-notch. Have a good one, guys. <laughs> Boy, Matt is still busting on us, but speaking busting on folks, they're doing that in Detroit with Wayne Fonts as a target. What's going on up there, Howie? Well, I'll tell you, you know, Ford being the owner there, he's one of the more benevolent owners there, and, you know, there's been some speculation that maybe his job is in jeopardy. But I tell you, with, with Ford as the owner, it won't be until the end of the year if he does not produce. You know, a number of things have gone wrong in Detroit. Number one, Eric Kramer and Scott Mitchell, two of the more controversial quarterback signings to this point in the season, gave the guy a boatload of money, has not performed well. They're going back to a two-back set the first time since they played Dallas and beat them in overtime. They, they're not happy with their defensive line not getting any rush. They bench Pat Swelling. They're making a lot of changes there. It looks like it's a desperate situation. Not pretty at all. All right, it is now time to check out what else is happening around the NFL. The Chiefs gallop home to host the Seahawks after Monday night's mile-high thriller. KC's plus seven turnover ratio ties them for tops in the AFC. And they've beaten Seattle six straight. But they'll have Chris Warren to deal with. He's got six touchdowns and is the AFC's fifth leading rusher. The Bengals meow into Cleveland's dog pound, still looking for their first win. The last time the Browns started 6-1, the other JB was in their backfield. Last week, Cincy's Alfred Williams stung the Steelers for four sacks, but sacks won't come easy today as the Browns are tied for the fewest sacks allowed in the NFL. When Pittsburgh steals into New York today, Bam Morris replaces the injured Barry Foster. The shrinking Giants are winless for the last month. Four TDs with just two picks resulted in three straight wins for Dave Brown and the Giants. But seven interceptions and only two touchdowns led to three straight losses. Don't count Dan Reeves out yet. His teams are 5-2 and two after losing three straight. All right, folks, and as game time approaches, we'll return with some final thoughts to help you enjoy today's action. Jim Everett, not the only ex-Ram enjoying a second life. Henry Ellert is as well with the struggling Redskins. He leads the NFC. Yeah, that's what you call NFC football. 